Welcome to another episode of Dad Up, everyone. Thank you guys very much for joining me. I'm very excited for the guest that I have on today because not only is she a mom, I have very few moms on my show, but I do have them on. Uh, but she is an author and she is the founder that, of a, a wonderful, wonderful institute that we're going to get into. We're going to talk a lot about it. Uh, but Dana Kay, thank you very much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Brian, for having me. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. Awesome. All right. So for my listeners who may not know who you are, let's dive into a back history of Dana, how you guys kind of started. I mean, you have a, you have a son, so I want to dive into that as well. But also, I want to hear more about um, the company that you have as well and the things that you're doing. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so I'm a board certified holistic health and nutrition practitioner, and I work with families uh, all across the USA. I know I don't sound like it, um, I'm, but I'm in here. I am from Australia, but I do live in Seattle, Washington, and I work with families all across the USA online, helping them and their children reduce symptoms of ADHD naturally. And my company, ADHD Thrive Institute, was born from my own experience um, for, for with, my, with my son. And, uh, you know, it led me to be able to help close to a thousand other families experiencing what I was with my own son. Uh, so I've been lucky enough to be able to do that with other families as well to get out of it's kind of a little bit like a re emotional roller coaster. It can be when you've got a child with these challenges. Uh, so I'm definitely going to go into some of that today. But I, I also just released a book. It's called Thriving with ADHD, and it's a natural guide to helping your child uh, reduce ADHD symptoms naturally. And so believe it or not, I actually wasn't in the health and wellness space. Uh, I was an accountant and, you know, I'd planned to sort of continue in that field and, and might have done so if, if concerns over my son's health hadn't have grown as much as they did. Uh, I always knew something was a little bit different with him. Even at the age of two, we used to go to the playground and he had so much more energy than every other kid there. He was never able to sit at the table and eat dinner and breakfast. He was uh, bouncing off the walls and he'd have these meltdowns and tantrums. You know, at, at the age of two, okay, you think terrible twos. Yeah, that's okay, completely age appropriate. But as the years went on, three, four, they continued and they got worse. And, you know, I would ask his doctor, I'd ask the teachers, is this normal? And they would say, yes, he's just a boy. He's just a boy. And me being a woman, not knowing really what it was like to be just a boy. Uh, obviously, my husband's like, yeah, he's just a boy. Uh, but, uh, you know, these continued and his tantrums and meltdowns and his hyperactivity got worse and worse. And by the age of four, that's when his teachers really started no noticing the difference. And we then went to the doctor, we got a neuropsychological valuation and he was diagnosed knows with ADHD and he was immediately put on medication and you know I remember feeling relieved by this diagnosis and so was my husband and we were excited because you know we were going to get a pill that was actually going to reduce his symptoms and was going to bring back that peace to our house I used to tell my husband you know I don't like my son you know I love him but I really mm. don't like him uh, and as a mom and as a dad, oh, the guilt that comes with that feeling is, mm. you know, not good. I was like, what kind of mom actually says that out loud? Uh, but when we got the diagnosis, when we got that medication, we knew that we weren't bad parents, you know, that there was something that was actually underlying here and that was causing these. We, it wasn't our parenting techniques. Um, and so we put him on meds and at first it was, it was good, but then his dosage increased and the side effects became worse and worse. Uh, the doctor prescribed another medication to tr to counteract the side effects of the first one. And mm. this continued until he was on three very strong medications at the age of five. And when the doctor suggested a fourth medication to counteract the side effects that had, new ones had popped up, I just sort of said, I can't do this anymore. And that's when my career path completely changed. I dove into all the research and the science and the you know, the studies and I went back to school and I did my holistic health degree and multiple specific certifications in this particular area. And I really learned that ADHD symptoms 
can be reduced naturally. I learned how food and other natural solutions, you know, can affect so many aspects of our lives. Mm -hmm. Now, today, my son is thriving. He hasn't been on meds for years. He's in middle school. And he, the most important thing, he's happy. Uh, and my family's happy and, and we now have peace and calm in our house. And, you know, I now tell my husband, I actually like him again. You know, he's getting into his teenage years. And so me and my husband are dealing with some of those, you know, teenage, uh, emotions, but it's normal teenage emotions. It's not all of this other stuff that we were dealing with, um, before. And, you know, so once I learned this, once we learned this, how important food can have on behavior and focus and all of this stuff, I couldn't keep this to myself. Uh, you know, it was not fair. I didn't want any parent to feel the way that we did. I didn't want their houses to be the horror house that ours was. And so that's why, you know, I now uh, help so many families out there. I've been able to help close to a thousand other families get to the same place as me, but just so much quicker and without as much pain as we went through. Hmm. Wow. Okay. Well, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, but yes. let me start with this because I have heard this and maybe you can kind of shed some light on it, but <clears throat> there may be people out there, maybe specifically to maybe the older generations that don't recognize ADHD as a legitimate condition. What would you say to those people? So uh, I'm going to start off by saying that there are 6 million children in the US that have been diagnosed with ADHD today. And I have worked with close to a thousand of them and about 50% of them uh, have, uh, we've changed their diet, just their diet, nothing else. And their symptoms have reduced or gone away completely. What that tells me, if we apply that percentage to that 6 million, that actually tells me that probably 3 million of those children have been wrongly diagnosed. It could be something else that's going on in their body. That being said, though, ADHD is a real thing. They're, the, the brain, the symptoms that come in the brain that are, you know, stop these kids and adults from functioning properly, uh, there's so many studies that support it. But it can be managed and it can be managed by medication or it can be managed naturally, but it's definitely a real thing. And, but I do think that it's being overdiagnosed. I think that, you know, especially with um, the schooling system these days in, you know, putting so much pressure on our kids to like sit down, right. uh, do workbooks, uh, you know, don't, don't make a noise. That's not how children should grow up. And that's not how like the past generations should grow up. And probably the older generations didn't have schooling like that. And so didn't have a lot of the symptoms that are happening to our children in these days. And so, yeah, they may think that it's not real, but it is real. The question is, what is the driving force behind it? Is it real in a way that it needs to be diagnosed or is there something else that are driving those symptoms? Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. I do agree with you. I do think that it's uh, overdiagnosed. Uh, I think that that's a quick conclusion that, you know, doctors would jump to uh, to help the situation, but it, you know, it may not necessarily help it. It might help it a little bit, but it may not necessarily get to the actual root cause. Do you think that maybe, uh, and you're talking from, um, you know, you're a holistic expert and you deal with a lot of the proper foods and stuff that really help kids in this, that have the situation. Do you think that maybe it could be tied to some of the preservatives and the added additive additives that are in some of these foods that we're eating? Oh, a thousand percent. I mean, I could, I could go on and on about this and, you know, and especially, and I'm going to say like, especially with fathers, uh, a lot of them, uh, you know, are non-believers about the food side of things. I can tell you my husband was, uh, sorry for throwing you under the bus. Uh, he's probably not hearing me. He's upstairs working. Um, but you know, it was the science that made me first rethink the direction that we were traveling with my son. Um, and the fact that he was having these significant side effects from the medication it was the science that convinced me that natural methods were worth a shot uh, and I'm going to dive into some of that in a second but I will say that a lot of the preservatives a lot of the colors that are used in American food are actually banned in other 
countries. Mm. And one of those is France, and they have the lowest diagnosis rate of ADHD in the world. And so, uh, you know, that really says a lot. Also, they process their wheat and gluten in a very different way, more of the ancient way compared to here. So you are spot on there. You know, back in the day when our grandparents were bringing us up, we didn't have all this packaged food. We didn't have all this artificial stuff. We ate whole foods. And so there probably was less of kids that were affected. And, you know, one of the strategies that we talk about when working with families is taking out artificial flavors, artificial colors and preservatives. And we help families through that. And as I said, 50% of the kids, we simply change their diet and their symptoms go away. So what does that tell you? It definitely tells you that there is a big connection. Right. But, you know, there are there's a lot of studies on artificial colours, especially causing hyperactivity in children. Uh, it, it, there was another study in 2011. It concluded that 64% of children diagnosed with ADHD were actually experiencing a hypersensitivity to food. So 64%. So hmm, I wonder what might happen if these children change their diets and remove the foods that they were sensitive to. Right. Would their ADHD symptoms get better? You know, I definitely believe they would. Uh, there was another study that showed that 56% of ADHD kids tested positive for food allergies. Mm -hmm. uh, compared to, uh, you know, kids in the general population at 8%. That tells me there's a clear correlation between ADHD and food allergies. And, you know, there was another study in 2017. I'll, oh, this is the last one I'll share with you, but these That's are, okay. you know, they're just, I think it solidifies. And it also it solidifies in, I think, more men, you know, women, women go on emotion more than men do and men go on science more than women do. And so, you know, I, I think that's why I just kind of wanted to share some of these studies with your audience. Um, but there was one in 2017 that concluded that the addition of micronutrients in the diet, you know, micronutrients and things like all those like good fruits and veggies and all those, those good stuff for you, they improved overall function, they reduced impairments, uh, it improved attention, emotional regulation and aggression. And so clearly medication is not the only way to help children with ADHD. Mm. Uh, I love that. So dads, uh, you're out there listening or watching this. Um, you know, how about you lead by example? Uh, we all talk about the you know, the infamous uh, dad bod, right? Uh, <clears throat> lead by example, start eating right and uh, teach your kids to eat right. And, um, you know, maybe it'll help, right? So uh, that's yes. that's great. Um, and well, it will help them as well, I will say. Like absolutely. the amount of times I've got families that do it all together, you know, the parents, the mum and the dad and the kids uh, do it all together. And the things, the changes in the parents are amazing. Like cholesterol drops 30 points, inflammation in their hips disappear when they were going to need medication. Uh, you know, so many things uh, positively are impacted by the change in diet. Type two diabetes is another one. Exactly. Yeah. Um, well, very cool. Let me ask you this kind of going back a little bit. Um, what are some of the common, I know you talked about, um, over being ener super energetic and then also the meltdowns, but what are some other common underlying stressors that you see in children with ADHD? So, you know, those, the hyperactivity and the meltdowns, they're more, you know, the symptoms that come from it. So just a few more of the symptoms, uh, you know, things like the inability to focus, um, uh, regulation of emotions. Um, so whether that's, you know, anxiety or, you know, crying at the drop of a hat, it doesn't necessarily have to be, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be like full on blown tantrums, but the ability, the inability to regulate their emotions is, is a big one. Um, attention, uh, executive function, planning, organizing, all of those things have, you know, challenges for kids with ADHD. And so you can have a combination of all of them. You can have, you know, hyperactivity and inattention, or you can just have the hyperactivity. Uh, my son was just the hyperactivity with the emotional dysregulation. He he didn't have like the focus issues, but there are many different of those like key symptoms that um, 
can happen when you do have ADHD. It's important that they don't just happen in one scenario. It's got to be in multiple scenarios. So like if it's just happening at home, but not at school, it's usually unlikely that um, there is something that's causing that. Uh, the ADHD is, you know, it's usually unlikely that it's ADHD. But at the same time, it's about the age that they get diagnosed because for my son, the teachers didn't recognize it until he was about four uh, mm. when he was at preschool and things like that. So, you know, when they're getting four, five, six, seven, and then these things are starting to come out, that's when we want to make sure that it's in, in multiple settings. Okay, got it. Well, now we're talking about school. Um, obviously, our kids are either just gotten back into school or about to go back mm -hmm. into school. How can parents prepare teachers to help their children, you know, with ADHD succeed? Yeah, look, that's a great question for the time of the year. And I was literally just talking about this in my free Facebook group. I've got a Facebook group of, of 20,000 parents that uh, have children with ADHD. You know, it's a support group. It's called the ADHD Parent Nutrition Support Group. I was literally talking about this this morning. So oh, cool. <laughs> perfect, perfect timing. And I think the biggest thing, the first thing that families should do is really speak to the teacher, communicate with them, talk to them about, you know, what their children, you know, how their children flourish. You know, you want to make sure that you want to set up their, their schooling for the best possible way for them to uh, get success. And, um, you know, I used to dread August and September, you know, and it, it would, you know, the back to school fears that would come up, but really getting that teacher on board um, and really understanding what they need to do to help your child thrive. Uh, you know, some kids uh, that are diagnosed can uh, uh, qualify for something called an IEP, which is an mm -hmm. individual educational plan, um, or a 504. And these are accommodations that are required by law for your child to receive uh, help um, for them to be educated if they need it. But in order to obtain one of those, you do need a diagnosis uh, and you do need to be affected in school, uh, in, you, you know, your schoolwork suffering. So even if you don't have an IEP or a 504, talking and communicating with the teacher is the best thing you can do and meeting with them on a regular basis about how your child's doing. Is there anything that you can do at home? Uh, another tip would be um, consider something like fidgets or alternative seating. Uh, you know, many children with ADHD are much better able to focus if they're allowed to sit in like a wiggle seat or a similar alternative seating arrangement. And likewise, fidgets uh, can be very effective at helping children with ADHD. You know, their hands, when their hands are busy, it allows their brains to focus on what the teacher's saying. Um, sometimes teachers are also able to place a child's desk close in close proximity to the teacher and this can often help children with ADHD because there are fewer distractions around uh, around them and when they're closer there's less distractions around them. I'd also suggest that parents actually work with them to build social skills. You know, children with ADHD are often lagging in social skills and, you know, using play to teach them social skills on a regular basis is really important, like practice taking turns or listening or showing interest in what other people say. You know, that's it's such a basic skill, but a lot of kids, even ones without ADHD, really don't realise they actually have to you know, show interest <laughs> in what the other person's saying. Um, so that's an important one. And look, the main one for me, and I will say this, and this is exactly what I preach, it's work to reduce inflammation in the body. Um, and it might sound like, you know, it has nothing to do with school behavior, but there is a huge connection between gut health and brain health. So if you improve the gut health, uh, you also improve the brain health. And when the inflammation is reduced uh, and the, the gut starts healing, uh, it's, it's easier for the child to focus, make better, you know, better choices, uh, be able to regulate their emotions more. And, and so to reduce inflammation, you want to start by getting rid of the most common inflammatory foods, which are things like gluten dairy and soy uh, and also those artificial flavors and colors and preservatives that we talked about earlier yeah. and then replace these foods it's not just about what to take out it's about what to put back in replace them with whole uh, micronutrient dense foods like whole fruits and vegetables grass-fed protein sources like you know meat eggs chicken poultry seafood and healthy fats 
to feed the brain. Our kids need healthy fats to, to feed the brain, things like avocado oil, coconut oil, and olive oil. And you're also avoiding those highly inflammatory oils uh, like canola oil and vegetable oil, things like that. They actually do damage rather than help reduce the inflammation. So, you know, over time, stay away from the ones that are causing the inflammation and bringing in other stuff a lot of parents see significant improvement in their behavior at school. Uh, their emotions are better. Their focus is better. They are less likely to struggle with impulsivity and hyperactivity. Uh, so uh, that's a big one. Yeah. No, okay. So you're talking about uh, all these healthy food options, which are, which are great. But uh, as a parent, you know, my boys are older, 23 and 20, but, you know, kind of growing up, it's hard to get them to yeah. eat all their vegetables. It's hard to get them to eat healthy. Um, you know, kids want to have a cookie. Kids want to eat a cupcake. Kids want to eat candy. Uh, so I'm sure you're not mentioning, you're not t saying cut that stuff out completely, right? I mean, obviously they can, they can have these treats here and there. What, what advice would you give on that? Yeah, look, um, there's two questions in that one. Um, you know, when you've got a kid with challenges with ADHD and their life and your life is being dramatically affected by it, then parents are motivated to make these changes. And so, you know, when I say go gluten, dairy and soy free, it really has to be 100%. But okay. that doesn't mean that they can't have cake, that they can't have muffins. It's just a different type. Uh, it's a gluten-free muffin or a gluten-free cake. They can have candy. There are better for you candies out there that don't have artificial flavors and artificial colors. Kids need to be kids. Um, yeah, it would be an amazing, you know, amazing world if we lived in this place where, you know, the school teachers weren't giving the kids candy or they weren't going to these birthday party, uh, parties coming home loaded with sugar. This is not going to happen. Uh, you got to be realistic here. But, you know, these are challenges that we help families overcome. And, you know, there are many strategies you can use when going to a birthday party, uh, when helping your family change the way that they eat. You know, the biggest, the biggest tip I'll have to say with, you know, parents out there is that Rome wasn't built in a day. Uh, transforming your family's diet won't be complete in a day either. You know, it's, a, it's, it's okay to take it slowly. It's, it's okay to take it one step at a time and you've got to take the kids on the journey with you. And so when you do it slowly, yeah. one product at a time, one meal at a time, the kids come on the journey with you. Uh, if that's one change a week or one change every Every two weeks that is perfectly okay you know you really need to give yourself permission to take it slow and remembering though it's not a diet it's not a phase it's a, it's a permanent lifestyle change and when it becomes part of your lifestyle it becomes second nature and then changes don't seem so hard or as overwhelming and it really does become your new normal you know you might be used to having taco tuesdays Tacos can be made gluten-free and dairy-free. It's just changing a couple of the ingredients. You can still have your Taco Tuesdays. It's just better for you. Uh, and so it's just changing some of those things and that mindset. Honestly, like when you implement this at home, when the dads out there start eating this way, they will feel so much better mm. and they will be motivated not to bring that back into the to, to the house. Um, but if they don't even try, then, you know, unfortunately it's probably not going to work uh, because we don't want to sabotage these things for our kids. Um, so, yeah, it's hard, um, but that's what I'm an expert in. That's what I help families overcome. Uh, and going to birthday parties, there are different strategies that we can do. Uh, and they don't have to not be kids. I think that's the biggest thing. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's 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 a process that, you know, it, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to jump in all at once. Uh, I think kind of building, working your way up, it's kind of like, uh, you know, developing a habit, you know, you got to work on it. 30 straight days before you really get that ingrained in you, right? Or building, you know, you want to build muscles at the gym. You got to keep, can't just go to the gym once and lift the weight and expect everything to be great. So you got to keep working at it. And I think starting smaller steps is a perfect uh, example of that one meal at a time, you know, a couple times a week and then increase it from there. And I think that's, that's great. And obviously I've, I've eaten a lot of healthy foods that you, you would think by the looks of them, they weren't healthy but they were and they're good they're actually pretty tasty so um yeah so i agree with you there yeah and look it's also about um adapting the 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 taste buds because 
you are used to uh, uh, eating a cookie that tastes a certain way. Right. And so when you are thinking to yourself, I'm going to have a cookie, but it's going to be gluten dairy free. Oh, that cookie is going to taste exactly the same way as the other one that I had. You're going to be disappointed because it doesn't taste the same way. Of course it doesn't. <laughs> But you just need to change your taste buds. And so, you know, you change it slowly and then you go and you have one of the other cookies and you're like, oh my gosh, that tastes awful because you're used to the gluten-free, dairy-free one that's with natural sugars rather than loaded with refined sugars. So, you know, we have a lot of kids that start eating this way and at first it's like, oh my God, but then, you know, they go and have a different type of cupcake that they're not meant to and it's like, whoa, whoa what's this so it's really just about what your normal is and it's it's that consistency it's like it can take 15 to 20 times for someone to accept a new flavor mm. and new texture so you know the same goes not only for our kids but for us as well uh you know if you're used to drinking a chocolate thick shake and all of a sudden you're like, yeah, I'm going to start drinking smoothies and I'm going to drink a green smoothie. You're going to be like, oh my gosh, that is disgusting. Never doing that again. Because, <laughs> yeah, I'm never doing that again. I'm used to drinking chocolate thick shakes. So you got to adjust it really slowly to get you to where you need to go. Right. All right. So that sounds great. But as I'm going to speak from a, a different parent's kind of point of view, as a parent, that's great. Uh, that doesn't sound super easy to do. Uh, and you know what? I think it's just better if we just medicate when it comes to that's the easiest approach. It'll get it'll help the situation that we're in. But what I want you to speak to parents about what are the dangers or possible long term effects of medicating for ADHD? Yeah, look, parents out there, you know, need to understand that the ADHD drugs are relatively new. So we really don't know what the long term side effects are. But I was actually just um, having I was being interviewed the other day and the father, the, there was a father on the on the on the on the interview. It was a mum and a dad and the dad had di had was diagnosed with ADHD and he went through a time in his life. Um, he'd never been on medication, but he thought I'm going to try Ritalin and he started to have suicidal thoughts mm. he was like oh my gosh i'm i'm hopeless i shouldn't be here my family don't need me uh and as soon as he stopped that medication they went away if an adult can have that type of reaction to ritalin just imagine what that's doing to a child's body so uh, you know not only will it stunt growth of a child um, it's going to change the brain chemistry it's going to change the gut microbiome and as you change the gut microbiome and this is a big part of what we do is that gut brain connection and we can dive into that if you want to but the gut is the center of everything. It controls 80% of our immune system. And so everything that we do and we put into our body is literally connected to what goes on in the gut. And so medication is toxic, full stop. There is a time and place for it, do not get me wrong, but it shouldn't be the first port of call and it shouldn't be used unless there is a, a really, really, you know, uh, outright problem that really needs to be, you know, solved or that it's going to be harmful for this child or, you know, this kid might, you know, ha uh, harm themselves. Like, a, you know, one of those like really um, a warning type of situation. But, you know, if a kid's not able to focus at school, should they be getting this toxic medication as a first round? You know, maybe when their body's in an optimum state of health. But if you're still pounding the body with these inflammatory foods that I've been talking about, anything that you give it is not going to work and it's going to do more damage. I like to think of it like this. And I think this is a really good example, especially when thinking about medication, you know, there's a lot of things that create toxicity in our body and toxic load or toxic burden on our body. One of them is food. Uh, one of them is environmental toxins. Uh, one of them is, you know, household toxins, mold, uh, you know, chemicals in the cleaning products. Um, toxins from medications, antibiotics. They basically kill all the ba the bacteria in your body, but they can't differentiate between the good and the bacteria. So we start off with an empty bucket. You know, the, a child starts off with a clean, empty bucket. And over the years, uh, all of these toxins go into that bucket. So whether it's like antibiotics, antibiotics, bad food, bad food, um, chemicals from, from cleaning products, all of this sort of stuff. And when that bucket 
fills up and fills up and fills up and tips over, that's when symptoms start happening. So our goal is to reduce toxic load on the body and you know you could be completely fine and not have any symptoms and be filling up your bucket and that bucket might not tip over until you're 50 or you're 40 or you're 30 but for our children that have these you know issues that bucket has already tipped over okay so what we need to do is we need to reduce that load on that body but by putting more medication in on it you're actually keeping that bucket tipping over. You're never going to get to a certain place. That medication is just putting a Band-Aid on symptoms. It's, uh, you know, pushing those symptoms down into the body. And when that medication wears off, they all come back. You know, it's not, it's not fixing the problem. It's not fixing the root cause, but it's also putting more toxic load on the body. And so that bucket's going to be spilled out constantly. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And it kind of leads me to my next question. And that's, um, you know, if I have a child that has been medicated for many, many years, and then let's say I just, I come across you and then the work that you do, and I start doing research and I contact you say, you know, is, is it safe to take my child off the medication and start with a more healthy approach? I mean, is that okay? Is that a kind of an okay transition to do? I will always say you need to work with your doctor if you're going to change your medication. I don't deal with medication and so that's not something that I am allowed to tell anyone. Um, But, uh, you know, I'm going to use my son as the example. He was on three strong medications and we started this process, okay? We started changing his diet. We started healing his gut. We started getting to those root causes that were causing his bucket to overload. We started to reduce that inflammation. We started to reduce that toxic load on the body And at the time where, you know, things were starting to get a little bit better, I worked with my doctor to slowly titrate off the medication that he was on one by one, slowly, slowly. And then probably within four to five months, he was off all medication. But that was my experience. Experience is different for everyone. Everyone's scenarios are unique. And so you should always consult your doctor before stopping or starting any new medication. That's one thing that I, you know, I can't advise on. Yeah. Okay. I understand that. Um, I know we talked, you had spoke about, you know, kind of eliminating, you know, gluten, dairy, soy, those kinds of things. Why are those things so detrimental to kids with ADHD? Yeah, look, they're so detrimental to most people. (laughs) Right. Um, But um, I think I'll start with gluten because that's really like the top food. Um, You know, it's the top one that I recommend for children with ADHD to cut out of their diet. Probably I recommend everyone to do it because it's so inflammatory and, um, you know, plain and simple gluten is harmful for everyone. And that's because um, gluten triggers increased intestinal permeability, which I'll talk about what that is in everyone, um, even those that don't show an allergic reaction to it or allergic response. And intestinal permeability refers to the breakdown of the intestinal walls in the gut. And when functioning properly, these walls of the intestine, they form a barrier and they allow water and nutrients to pass through going into our cells to give us everything we need. But it blocks other things from entering the bloodstream. So when a person has increased intestinal permeability, This can lead to leaky gut, which basically means the tight junctions in the gut that are supposed to control what passes through the lining of the intestine aren't doing their job. And that allows toxins and other harmful substances to pass through the bloodstream that aren't supposed to be there. So what do you imagine happens when these toxic substances, you know, come into the bloodstream, that bucket tips over and all of a sudden it's in our bloodstream. Now, if you're thinking that the body fights them off and tries to get rid of them, that's exactly what happens. And when something enters the bloodstream that isn't supposed to be there, it triggers an inflammatory response as the body seeks to rectify the issue. So like, you know, you get, you know, you get a virus or a parasite or something and that gets into the bloodstream, the body tries to kill it off so you can get better. So gluten leads to increased intestinal permeability, which leads to leaky gut which leads to inflammation, which leads to additional symptoms like constipation, brain fog, inattention, hyperactivity, anger, uh, you know, reflux, so many different symptoms, but a lot of those 
you know, correlate with ADHD. Um, so by cutting out gluten and the other substances, uh, parents of children with ADHD are removing foods that it significantly contribute to inflammation in their body. And in my experience, if we remove these, then uh, um, and we start feeding the body the right way, families find that the ADHD symptoms diminish significantly and sometimes disappear completely because they're allowing the gut to heal. But it all comes back to the gut brain connection. Um, do you want me to dive into that one? Do it. Let's do it. Yeah. So what is it? What's the gut brain connection? Right. But I'm actually going to uh, going to start off with a with a couple of um, statistics. And I think that this is just really important to understand. But 54% of American children were diagnosed with a chronic illness in 2018. And that figure was only 15% a couple of years ago. And so looking at that increase, it's sort of like, oh my gosh, what has been going on? And, you know, you're probably right in thinking, well, it's all of those preservatives and, you know, this, the crap that we're eating. Um, one in two have anxiety, asthma, type one, type two diabetes, uh, cystic fibrosis, heart problems, sinus problems, hyperactivity, one in five have allergies, one in six have developmental delays and one in 68 have autism. I think that number has now reduced at like to half that amount, like one in 32 or something. Um, but, you know, as I said earlier, or did I say earlier? I can't remember, but, um, you know, the, it, the rise is occurring so rapidly and the answer to the reason is because it begins in the gut. 80% of the body's entire immune system is within the gut wall along with billions of nerve cells and an extensive amount of beneficial gut bacteria. So all of our children's health is quite literally connected to everything that goes on in the gut. So if we start with that, the gut's the center of everything. Diet is the foundation, the gut's the center of everything. But I wanna talk about the gut-brain connection and the gut is very tied very closely tied to the to the brain and that's because there's a two-way communication between the two now basically what that means is when our gut isn't functioning well our brain isn't functioning well as well and um i just want to probably dumb it down a little bit for you think of it like this um you know have you ever felt like butterflies in your stomach because you were nervous about something you know maybe it was a first date or a, or a test right. or a conflict <laughs> um, you know, they're perfect examples of the gut brain connection. Our bodies perceive whatever we're nervous about as a stressful situation. And then our brains trigger these raw emotions in our gut resulting in butterflies or feeling nausea uh, in the stomach. And that's the brain talking to the gut, but the reverse is also true. Our guts talk to our brains as well. And so when the gut is broken down um, and has a higher level of, of bad gut bacteria, um, that's called gut dysbiosis. And that gut dysbiosis creates inflammation that travels up through the vagus nerve to the brain. And once this reaches the brain, it creates all of these symptoms. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the main areas involved in gut function is the frontal lobe the one here and the frontal lobe is involved in things like uh attention focus mm -hmm. executive function planning organizing problem solving the things that we, we've been talking about and they're all you know areas that people with adhd struggle with um but another another thing also and this this doesn't just relate to adhd it relates to all mood disorders um 95 percent of serotonin and 50 percent of the body's dopamine is produced in the gut and these neurotransmitters are the ones that help manage emotions balance mood help our cognitive function and emotional dysregulation is a common symptom of adhd but many caregivers don't realize that emotional dysregulation actually starts in the gut where the serotonin and the dopamine are made. So the problem isn't the emotions themselves, it's that the body isn't able to produce the right amount of these vital neurotransmitters in the first place. So work on improving the gut health, you work on improving all of these symptoms. And you work on improving the gut health by eating right, eating the things that you're supposed to be eating that your body will accept uh, and uh, process the right way. 
Yeah, that's one of the one of the ways that we do it. We also look to see if there's any anything else going on in the gut, like parasites or uh, candida overgrowth, and then we target that with specific supplementation to really uh, get rid of it, heal the gut with you know heal the gut lining, and then you know improve that gut brain connection. Okay, got it, man. That's fascinating. Wow, <laughs> that is fascinating. I, I think I'm gonna, need, I'm gonna need to do some more research myself. So <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, uh, well, look thank at you. It's, for... it's eye opening. Yeah. No, I mean just just in what you're sharing, I'm just I'm I'm blown away. So uh, that's very cool. Um, well, let me ask you this. You know, if a parent wants to, you know, a father or a mother decides, you know what, I'm gonna get my family on the right track. You know, kind of eating healthy, mm-hmm. but Dana, what are some of the challenges like in your own experiences with making kind of a lifestyle change in how you eat as a family? What were some of the challenges that you guys experienced? Yeah, look, there were there were challenges and I'm not going to lie about it. Um, you know, uh, obviously getting the kids on board is is one of those challenges, as we were discussing earlier. And, you know, the biggest tip for that is that, you know, go slowly. That was for me probably the biggest thing. I actually tried to change everything on day one. Um, and this is not the approach that I teach <laughs> families. I think I was like huddled up into a ball on my on my bedroom floor, you know, multiple panic attacks because I was like, what on earth am I going to uh, feed my family? But um, we got over that, we got through it, and that's not how I teach to do things. So everything that I did wrong is not what I teach. Um, so that's the biggest thing is, you know, really take it slow. Another one is, you know, it can be expensive or we've got this mm. mindset that eating right. healthy can be expensive. Um, you know, I wish that someday I would love to see for this to change. I would love to see healthy food be the same price or even cheaper than the processed CRAP food that we right. see on the shelves. You know, that's a story for another day. But, right. you know, there are definitely things that we can do to make healthy eating more affordable. Things like meal planning, you know, buying things on sale. You you eat out less also, and that's so much mm. cheaper. So there are all these tips and tricks that I share. But I think one thing that really helped me, and this actually wasn't, you know, a way to save money, but more of a mindset shift, is to remember that even though these cheaper foods, uh, cheaper bad food choices may seem like an easier, better uh, option for the budget today. They actually cost us so much more in the long run in the form of tantrums and meltdowns and upset tummies and our kids not being able to form friendships and your house being an emotional roller coaster. And when I really had this mindset shift, it helped me a lot because I would much rather have a higher grocery bill today and a happier, healthier family than a lower grocery bill, but with constant tantrums of a child whose body was racked with inflammation Um, and a child's body that I didn't like. You know, I didn't like my son. I loved him, but I didn't like him. And, you know, uh, I I do now. (laughs) And that's really important for me. So, you know, I would much rather pay a little bit more in groceries than have the challenges that we had. Um, You know, it may cost a little bit more than a bad American diet, um, but you actually end up saving money, less medical bills, um, Mm -hmm. less in the long run, better health, um, you know, and so right now it might seem a lot, um, but, you know, there's all these tips that we can bring in, like I said earlier, to really reduce the cost. You know, another one is uh, taking a look at the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15 by ewg.org. And mm-hmm. this is to figure out if uh, which foods you should buy organic for and which ones are okay to buy non-organic. Uh, you know, foods that are highly sprayed in, in pesticides actually fill up that toxic load in the bucket that's going to tip it over. Um, but you don't need to buy organic for everything. And that really helps you to do that. Oh, that's excellent. And I agree with you. Um, you know, it may be a little bit, and you know what, it's not, it's not that much more expensive. It is, it is a little bit more expensive, but, um, the long-term, uh, benefits of doing that, um, whether it's like you said, uh, medications or staying healthier. So you're not having, getting sick so often or going to the doctor so often. Um, I compare it to like, you know, people that debate whether they should really, they can really afford to get life insurance. Well, you really can't afford not to get life insurance because it's really not for you. It's for the benefit of your family, right? So it's kind of the same, along the same kind of lines where you're buying these foods that are healthy for you that may be more expensive, a little bit more expensive, but 
the long-term benefits that you're going to gain for it are worth so much more than going down to McDonald's and buying the so cheaper meal much now. More. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like so. when your child grows into becoming an adult and, um, or even being at school and they're picked on and they've got no friends and they're unhappy and then they get depression and then they, you know, start to dwell in that. And then, you know, they have, that you're like your household is like walking on edge eggshells or you know you want to get off that that roller coaster I get, paying a little bit more in food is like so worth it yeah worth it for sure um well that's excellent now we've talked i know my listeners are going okay brian this sounds like it's all about the diet well it is but this is really more for informational on how to kind of treat this this situation that's really happening uh to a lot of the kids out there now especially uh and it's becoming more prevalent now uh but mm -hmm. i want to kind of address something let's kind of step aside from the food for instance let's uh, you're giving yeah. a lot of health tips and stuff and that's great but beyond the foods you know, that our you know our children are eating what are other necessary steps that parents can do to support uh adhd naturally yeah sure look and i i think it comes back to the, the bucket analogy isn't it it's like trying to reduce that toxic load or toxic burden on the body so you know we talk about food uh that can be a big load uh we talk about cleaning products you know going again ewg.org has a great section um uh, for cleaning products and rating the ones that you've got how toxic they are or how not toxic they are personal cleaning products, personal care products as well. They've got a, a skin deep part of the website where they look at the personal care products. Um, but also then, you know, diving a little bit deeper, okay? Um, are there underlying concerns that are contributing to these symptoms? Uh, things like nutritional deficiencies or food intolerances. And, you know, for, for instance, my son had a, a sense of food sensitivity to raspberry. I mean, mm. who would have thought like raspberry right. is healthy. Um, so this was driving inflammation in his body. You know, another child I worked with a few years ago had a banana sensitivity. Um, mm. And my ki kids eat bananas is like they're going out of fashion but you know once we learn about that sensitivity you know you can temporarily remove it uh it typically you know reduces the inflammation in the body we work on healing the gut and then we can add it back in uh other things like heavy metals is another big one we look to see if there's a heavy metal overload in the body again that's something that's going to tip that bucket over um we're looking at neurotransmitters is the body producing serotonin is the body producing dopamine so we do this with functional lab testing mm -hmm. um and you know typically these aren't tests that you can get at the doctor which is very unfortunate at, at you know at a traditional doctor you can get it at a naturopath a holistic health practitioner like I am. Um, and this really allows us to investigate that particular body. We do stool testing, we do urine testing, we do blood testing, and we look for things like, you know, parasites, yeast overgrowth, uh, bacterial overgrowth. We look at where inflammation is coming from leaky gut reactivity to gluten are we even able to digest the food that we're eating you know if we're eating good stuff can we even digest it do we have the right digestive enzymes in our, in our gut you know um we're also looking at mold toxicity you'd be surprised mm. how many kids have their bodies riddled with mold and mold symptoms are a big the first symptom of mold exposure is brain fog brain fog aka inattention ADHD, you know, um, another thing is detoxification pathways. You know, when we've got that bucket that's full and it tips over, if we can't get rid of all that toxic overload, you know, it's all in our body floating around. Think of it like a, you know, a vacuum cleaner. Do you remember back in the day where they had the bags? They don't have the right. bags anymore. Um, and so like you vacuum your house and it fills up the bag. And then if you go and pop that bag in a room, say that room is going to be filthy. Right. That's what happens in the body if your detoxification pathways aren't working properly. Um, another common uh, underlying stressor for ADHD is something called um, pyrroles. And most people are like, what on earth is that? Yeah. Like <laughs> no one talks about it. Um, it's actually a normal chemical byproduct in the body. And 
Um, it attaches to B6 and zinc and it draws these elements out of the body when they're extruded through the urine. And so if someone has these elevated uh, cryptopyrrole levels, it results in a dramatic deficiency of zinc and B6. And these are two critical nutrients needed for uh, mood, you know, mood, um, mood issues. And um, it's frequently identified in ADHD, depression, uh, behavioral disorders, and symptoms include things like poor tolerance to physical or emotional stress, poor anger control, mood swings, poor short-term memory, mm. sensitivity to light and sound and tactile sensitivities. And again, a lot of those are symptoms of ADHD. So let's wow. actually dive deep, look at what's going on in the body, target that, give it what it needs. So we don't have these symptoms anymore. And that kid can feel better. You know, when a kid's melting down, that's actually not them just not getting their way. It's their, bo it's their body telling you, mum, dad, dad, something else is going on. It's not normal for me to melt down for an hour and scream and kick and, you know, bite. There's something going on in my body that is contributing to that. Hmm. Wow. That's a lot of, uh, that's a lot of information that, uh, you know, I know she, I know she shared a lot of information in there, especially in the last, you know, almost hour now. Um, but uh, it's worth it and checking it out. Uh, I mean, it's amazing. The stuff that I had no clue about um, that it's, I'm just blown away. I really am. <laughs> A lot of great information, Dana. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, you're so welcome. Look, I was blown away at first as well. Um, but then when you learn it, it's like, well, how can I unlearn that? I now know that. And right. um, you just, it's, it sends you down this rabbit hole of wanting to find out more and more and more like, well, if that's that, like maybe this is something else. And um, it is, it's, it's mind blowing and it still blows my mind to this day. Yeah. Well, awesome. Let me ask you this. If my listeners wanted to learn more about maybe Thrive or you, maybe get the book, yeah. what's the best place for them to do that uh, to get all that information? Yeah, definitely. Uh, my uh, website is ADHDthriveinstitute.com. Uh, if you want to look up the book, you can go to ADHDthriveinstitute.com forward slash book. Uh, and I'm on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, all at ADHD Thrive Institute. Uh, try to make it easy for everyone and keep it all the same. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, uh, Dana, listen, it's been a pleasure having you on. Thank you very much for sharing all the information that you shared. Um, so much knowledge in there uh, and so much that people really need to go and start researching and learning themselves to really help change how their kids are feeling and ultimately help change how the family feels as a whole. So uh, thank you very much. It's, it's been awesome having you on. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks so much, Brian. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you guys very much for another episode of Dad Up. A thank you again to my good friend, Dana Kay, for being on and sharing all the important information when it comes to ADHD and our kids. Make sure you guys are checking out her website, getting the book, uh, looking up more information so that you can be better educated on how to take care of better care of your child, also taking care of better, better care of your family. And I look forward to seeing you all on the next episode of Dad Up. Thanks so much for listening to the episode. Make sure you guys subscribe to my podcast and YouTube channel. And please do me a favor, leave a rating and a review. Would love to hear from you and see what you think of the show. Stay tuned for more exciting episodes each week. Until next time, thank you for listening to the Data Podcast. Podcast.